Hey everybody, welcome to Nerdarchy for Nerds by Nerds. I'm Nerdarchist Ted, and today I'm joined by... Nerdarchist Dave. And it's that time, it's Critical Role, we're doing Campaign 2, Episode 12, Recap and Review. Jump down to the description below where you can sign up for Nerdarchy the newsletter, get weekly gaming tips, as well as learn how to game with Nerdarchy. All right, I guess it's time to ask, is it Friday yet? <laughs> is it Friday yet? Uh, you know, so that that's for those of you who might be just, you know, coming into this, that's that's typically when we watch Critical Role. Uh, you know, staying up to the, the late hours and watching it on a Thursday night, being on East Coast versus their West Coast time, it just doesn't happen. So what are we? Campaign 2, Session 12. 12. Yes, and as always, there are spoilers in this. <laughs> All right, so we knew going into it that they were... In a time crunch for this, uh, you know, this plot, this, you know... Well, there was a party going on, and they wanted to do their subterfuge and stuff while this gala was going on. Right. Uh, they were going to use that as kind of like the distraction. So there's a little bit of setup time while, while... Or before the gala starts. They, they get X amount of time. Uh, Bo and Jester, they go and they, they scope out the first place... They had technically been to the first place, but they didn't really do it as a canvassing mission. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, the other guys were, you know, doing other things, and like they they sneak into uh, some of the or not sneak into, but they sneak to you know the other people in the order's place to try and be like, hey, do you have any writing that we might be able to use to forge? Well, and there's some things that happen first. One, you know, first of all, when they go back into the tri spire, it's Bo and Jester. And that all goes, that goes pretty, actually, pretty, uh, pretty smoothly. They're able to case the place without any problems. And they're like, all right, we might be able to get in here or there. You know, they, 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 they got to get the lay of the land. Right. Then they want to go to the, they want to go check out, you know, the other place. And they also have to uh, go talk to um, Dolan at some point as well. Right. Uh, because they realized there was some information that they didn't quite have, and they also wanted to know some other places that they might go to get writing samples. Uh, you know, so when they go to Dolan's, uh, Ford goes in disguise, you know, casts his disguise self on him, on him asks, asks some questions, figures out who kind of disposed Dolan and, you know, had their connection to the High Richter. Um, and, you know, after he kind of, like, you know, gets the information that he needs, goes back to the rest of the group... And you're like, did you find out this? <laughs> <laughs> so he's like, you know, if all goes well, you, sh you, you, won't, you won't see me again. And he's back two seconds later. <laughs> yes. Uh, so he goes back, asks Caleb a question. They're like, nope, don't have that either. Mm -hmm. like, crud. <laughs> crud. You know, and, you know, so then, then all kinds of craziness ensues. So we, we get to the bulk of this episode's undertaking, and that's at the gala. Well, well, no, even before that, like there, I think there's a lot of crazy stuff that happened, because as we said, the one scouting mission went really smoothly. The second one did not. Like, <laughs> that, not that's just funny. But anyway, <laughs> Molly Buck is like, all right, I got a plan. I'm gonna need a lot of breakfast foods, uh -huh. and I'm gonna need some other things. <laughs> And then I'm going to fake. He's like, as a carny, you know, we probably fake being lepers all the time, and we're gonna. I'm gonna need some, you know, to apply some cosmetics. Well, and I, they're like, I totally would have just glossed over the the sheer hilarity of. Yeah, I think this to... was a big part of the session. They spent a lot of time with this. <laughs> they did. Um, and he's like, I need to put boils and 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 uh, kind of all kinds of like pox and stuff like that on on, on my me. junk. <laughs> well, yeah, and like they're like, yeah, you're gonna put that on your face. Like, no. <laughs> He's like, I'm gonna put this on my junk. I want to, you know, scramble up some mayonnaise, some hot hot sauce. Some some uh, eggs, and I'm gonna put it in in my uh, in my flask, and all over my junk. <laughs> it's like, oh my god. Yeah. So so Molly Monk goes in to be a distraction, and go goes into because it's like a it's like a uh, like a, a doctor or medical place, right? And, An infirmary. Yeah. And he goes in like vomiting all over the place, and then you know, not comes in disguised well, as a baby, well, he, held by Caleb. C Caleb casts disguised self on himself to look like a half orc, and he walks in with not, you know, all wrapped up, and saying she's got a fever, 
<laughs> and as soon as the nurse looks at not, he goes, <laughs> and oh my God, the, the, the reactions on that one. And, well, and that was particip- uh, precipitated by the failed deception check. You know, so that's why the hiss and and scares <laughs> scares the the nurse the the person working there, and they're like they're just like get it out, get it out. <laughs> so they like you know grab, grab Caleb and they're trying to get him out. Meanwhile, the the craziness that that's going on, um, with with, uh, with Molly Mock, they wind up putting him in a cell. You know, Ford, you know, is, is winds up getting disguised self and makes himself look like, um, you know, someone who works there. So, like, the entire party is getting is getting split up. And I'm like, how is this going to go? Is Molly going to get locked in and they're going to have to do a rescue mission? Mm-hmm. You know, Ford does wind up getting some papers. Uh, Caleb and, and Not wind up getting good enough stealth rolls to just flee. And since Knott's a rogue, he's so much faster than Caleb, so he's like, I'm not going to just leave you. So she stays with him, you know, for, for the for the flee. And you know, I was like, all right, well, I guess the, the guard rolled low enough on his perception or on his pursue or what have you, and the two of them wind up getting away. Um, you know, Ford is easiest with him always being able to disguise, so he's able to slip out. And eventually Molly, uh, you know, sees all this craziness, and he winds up, uh, you know, getting out as well. Ah, uh, crazy. So it was a whole, a, a whole big hubbub that amounted to nothing. <laughs> all they got was patient records. That does not... In any it wasn't way, what they were looking for at all. It does not have anyone's, uh, anyone of imports writing. But... It was certainly hilarious to watch. Uh, they, you know, when they went back to the inn, and uh, you know, not goes to Caleb. He's like, "Hey, can you look at these for me and let me know if these are magic?" And goes to the story of how he found these bracers, the you know, ba- bracelets essentially. Right. And and the, and uh, you know, Caleb is stuck on you. Someone was killed here, and they hid the body. It's like, uh, so you found these on a dead body and, and in, not, the, in the place that we sleep. Yeah, and that's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. You think there's gonna be ghosts? And like, he's like totally like brushing it aside. Like, he's, he's, like, he's like, what? What are they worth? Are they? Are they, valuable? Do they, are they magic? Properties? Yeah, and you know, and not is totally like totally dismissing the body. And Calv is deeply concerned about. Wait a minute, people are being murdered here, and they're hiding bodies. And not is just like, ah, hey, you know, I'm a goblin. Like that's that's, that's normal. That's normal. This is what happens. <laughs> I mean, you're just lucky when it's not you. So yeah, so 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 that we had that kind of interaction going on, which was pretty fun, and then we kind of you know eventually we do get to to the to the gala. We get to the mission in hand. So as always, it, they've got to get into the tri spire, and since they're going to be wearing fancier clothes, a mission through the sewers was not going to going to happen this time. So Jester decides that she's going to try and distract the guards with a conversation about where's the candy shop. And she winds up holding their attention enough for the five of them to sneak in, which I'm, I was a little impressed. I'm like, well, you know, I wonder how this is going to go. Um, and then as she does so, she remembers, holy crap, what about Ulog? <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> they have to go back and get it. So, so she does have a reason to then, you know, yeah. go to the Penta Market, or at least head that direction, to be able to circle back and go and pick up Ulog, who is furious. David <laughs> kept waiting. And she tries to play it off like, oh, we were here waiting for you. We must just not have seen you. And rolls a horrible persuasion roll. Yeah, yeah. Well, and before the break... Before the break, they kind of like were like, "Oh yeah, we have to go pick up Ulog on the way." And they came back from the break, and they just went into the thing. I get as a GM, that's like one of the things I would have just glossed over and been like, "Yeah, you guys would have did that." You picked you picked them up already, you know? Yeah, it, or, yeah or I would, you know, you could backtrack and roleplay a little bit if it was necessary. But for the most part, there's certain things in a D and D game that you as a player may forget about, but your character probably wouldn't. Because they're there and living in that world where you as a player, you're here like once a week or however often you're playing, and you're not really that character, so it's a lot easier for you to forget about like details that your character probably wouldn't have. Like, if you're going to go off on an adventure, you're not going to forget to pack rations. 
Like, you know you need to eat. You don't forget, ah, oh, you know what, I'll just, you know, I'll wing it. I've, I've definitely played with enough douchey DMs. They're like, is it on your character sheet? It's like, um, dude, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The 10th level fighter that adventures all the time and I forgot rations. Yeah, that's exactly what would happen. <laughs> uh, you know, so, so some of that stuff in our own games, we just kind of like, ah, you know what, you know, player, players are fallible and forget and not to mention that like certain characters in that group have extremely high intelligences so they're a lot less likely to have that happen have that happen than we are uh and like calb has like that instant memory uh feat i forget the name of it it's not observant it's the other one but mm -hmm. um the, well you know actually like i was thinking about one thing with the way travis plays his character ford mm -hmm. He does not play his wisdom at all. He is the most level-headed of all the whole group. I, I feel like. And I don't. I don't know what his wisdom is. Off a seven. Of. Oh, he's a seven. He's got a negative two. Ah, okay. And I feel like he's just not playing that negative two. He makes good decisions. Like uh, he needs to. He needs to. You know, go back and take some of the lessons from uh, the first campaign of what uh, Tiberius did. I would not know. I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently Ted is going back and is now watching the first I, uh, campaign. I am. I have been, you know, suckered in, roped in, however you want to call it. But I'm, I'm enjoying myself. Uh, but Tiberius in the first campaign had a wisdom of four. Oof. Oof. <laughs> and he, he did it really well. I, I, I He was my favorite, favorite character uh, so far. And I know there's stuff that happens and sadly he winds up going away. But wah, anyway, wah, wah. back to episode two, episode twelve of campaign two. Uh, so they they wind up getting in to the, the tri spire, and you know Matt kind of you know circles things around really quickly to get the group back together. And they have a plan. And they have a plan. Is it a cunning plan? Uh, it's a it's a pretty good one, <laughs> but they they go to uh, you know the the Sutan's place, and you know at first like some of the players thought that that was like a title, but that was just the dude's name. Yeah. And they're like, well, there's the tree, and there's the fence, and there's the the roof, and it's not all that far. And after the hilarity of trying to get to the roof, they realize that you know the knot could have just mage tanned the thing into place. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so like there was some grumbling and growling there, but they wind up you know creating or finding their way in through the roof. Into a into a cool you know antechamber, and, and from a experienced GM, it's like oh you know based on what happens, there was some animated armor and an and a flying sword that was gonna be there, but they wind up deactivating that trap, and there's the the rug, and I'm like and I wonder if that's supposed to be a rug of smothering as well, and they wind up fighting the rug of smothering. If they hadn't deactivated the trap and they had to fight all four of those things, that would have been tough. Not, it wouldn't have been tough. I don't think they could have won. Animated armor? Armor? It's a, is that the 20, right? AC 20, That's yeah. an AC 20. If he uses straight out of the book, based on the trouble that the rug gave them. That's true. I do not think they could have taken two suits of animated armor, a flying sword, and a rug, a rug of smothering. You're probably, you're probably right. Uh, I, I mean, mean, there was definitely some choices that. Uh, that the players made that that weren't uh, weren't particularly good, but that being said, um, you know maybe they felt that's how what their character would do or whatever. But Bo attacking the rug of smothering and nearly killing Not, <laughs> you know, was you know, I, we, was pretty tough. I, you know, I really feel like, and I think some of the players were calling it out, but but Matt, I feel like Matt was being nicer. He you know he educated that it was only one failed death save. Mm -hmm. But I really think that's two because I don't think it has to be a critical. I just think you take that if you take damage when you're down, right? It's considered two failed death saves. I could be mistaken on that. There's a little nu little nuance there, and even so, it's his game. You can run it however he wants. <laughs> that that's where I was gonna was gonna go. Um, but yeah, but I I you know like like that was brutal. That uh, you know that she attacked him not not put him down and then attacked him after he was down essentially, <laughs> and everyone else was like, oh, "It's two failed death saves." <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I've used I've used uh, animated armor in a fifth level game, and had had issues because the party was like, "Well, this is the first encounter. I'm not gonna not gonna use all of my abilities now," and that encounter went on for 
much longer than it should have. It was a one-on-one fight for a little while too, right? And the player just could not hit. Right. It was one one or two rounds before everybody else showed up, and it was just AC twenty. You know, even at even at fifth level, that's really difficult to to hit sometimes. Yeah, you roll. You need to roll like a fourteen or better at least. You know, and we're looking at you know these guys are third level, and. They have a history of rolling poorly. <laughs> that is so. true. In this session, they did a lot of rolling poorly. Uh, so we they wind up, you know, circumventing the the two suits of animated armor, the flying sword. I was a little sad that it like that that's what they were, or what I'm speculating that they were, because once she flipped the switch, so to speak, in the in the brick, it was like they were no longer magical. So I'm like, okay, well. They're not. It's not treasure to take away. Sad for them, um, you know. And then they they got some kind of stone out of out of the box while that that Caleb swiped while um, Jester starts you know making the notes and sealing the wax and doing what she's there to do for the forging. Well, and then there's also there also like there was also almost some party violence as well. You know they you know Caleb is going to steal some scrolls. Well, that's in the second place. Oh, okay. Well, so, so once once they finally get through and get out of the way, meanwhile, Ford and um, Molly Mock, they're outside just there to be distractions and what have you. And thankfully, they uh, they manage to play their part well. Jester winds up falling off the roof. <laughs> <laughs> and Molly Mock's like, oh, my love! And walks over, because there's a guard who's there to investigate what's going on. And he looks at it, it's like, well, she's a tiefling, I'm a tiefling, maybe they'll buy it. And mm-hmm. does a horrible role in his persuasion, again. <laughs> um, but they get shooed off, and they, they manage to get away from the scene intact, without any kind of pursuit. Yay, great. When they get to the High Richter's house, they realize... We haven't cased this place. Mm -hmm. We really have no idea how we're getting in because they had seen previously there was a front door that's always manned, as you would expect. You know, it's High Richter's place. So they wind up sneaking around to the back, and thankfully they're able to up and over the fence, get in through the back door, no problems. And they see that there's got to be some kind of trap here as they notice the statues have like dust on the floor around it, but if you were to turn the statues in a certain way, there's areas that are not covered in dust. So perhaps this is, you know, yet another trap to circumnavigate. And when they turn the statues simultaneously, nothing bad happens, and they're able to proceed upstairs. And this is where we wind up getting into the whole issue as... You know, Caleb winds up finding some scrolls that he wants to keep, and you know, Ford is like, "Well, I'm going to be the last one in the room," and not draws draws on Ford, and it creates this this whole scene, and and Ford draws on Caleb, yeah. So like, yeah, Ford drew first, and then Caleb, and then not drew on Ford, and like it becomes this you know standoff of like, okay, who's going to back down? And Ford's like, you know, we're supposed to be doing this as a team, and you have to decide right here, right now. Are you a part of this team, or are you are you flying solo? Is this all about you? And I, I thought it was was kind of a, a, a cool moment, and was was happy to see how things panned out. Um, they did they did find you know information, um, you know Ulag got got the letter that confirms that his wife was put away needlessly. They did draft up the the letters that they that they wanted and. We're able to, you know, put everything in its place, and that's when, as everyone's leaving, you know, Caleb and Ford both want to be the last one in the room. And, you know, this happens. And while this is going on, they start hearing noises outside as the door opens. And apparently the people who were on watch, which at this time it was uh, uh, Bo and, and Molly Mock, they... Continually <laughs> rolled horribly on all their per- all their perception rolls and had no clue that the real High Richter came home. Uh, you know, utter utter hilarity. Uh, you they know, at that moment they get they can they get confronted. Uh, Jester's ready to throw spells and she summons the guards and Jester's like, "Nope, I'm going to cast hold person." 
High Richter winds up not twinning the, the roll, so she's not held, laughs at Jester at, at trying to cast a spell. And this is when Ulog, you know, breaks into motion. He takes the scroll that he's already showed off to the High Richter, showing that they have proof. Because she, um, she she essentially mocked him when he does, right. saying, yeah, that's great, you have proof, but how are you going to get out here to the show? This place is going to be swarming with cars any second now. And then she rings the bell. And she rings the bell. So he tosses the scroll, or hands the scroll f- physically to Caleb, grabs the, the bead off his necklace, and lunges at her. He opens her mouth, shoves the bead in, and holds it there. A giant fireball explodes. It kills her. It kills Ulog. It drops (laughs) Caleb. It nearly kills Caleb. (laughs) (laughs) You know... And he's like, oh, I, I rolled low. 21. And he's like, I'm, I'm unconscious. Yeah. Um, so it now becomes a race of, we really need to get the heck out of here. Um... So they grab Caleb's body, and it's, you know... Well, before that, all hell breaks loose. Like, before that, like, this commotion on the street's happening, and basically it's, like, 9-11 D&D uh, version. This, ha- this happens after they get outside. Oh, is that after yeah, they get outside? Yeah. So they they get they get outside. Um, you know, Je- Jester grabs Caleb. Uh, Ford, you know, he- heads out with the two of them. Not... Really knows that you know Caleb one of those things, so he quick runs back into the room, grabs those things, and jumps out the window because let's face it, the windows were you know shattered outward when from the, from, from the explosion of the fireball. Once they're outside, um, that's why I thought they were inside when all that stuff started happening because I because I knew that. Uh, that not was still in the room right. when he had and he actually like just jumped out the window. So they, they you know, we, we look outside and the mage tower is apparently under attack by some some uh, you know individuals. Yeah, it sounds like to me it sounded like a sphere of annihilation went off. Yeah, that that's what I would have uh, you know you know uh, detonating the detonating the bomb. We also had our first suicide bomber in uh, campaign two as well with yeah, Ulog. Ulog. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, you're willing to put a you know fireball bead down someone's face and both of you die. Yeah, that, that kind of works with that. So the the mage tower is under attack. Looks like a sphere of annihilation goes off. Two people jump jump out and begin to make haste away from the tower, pursued by two flying robed you know, lightning wielding mages. Um, one of them winds up getting getting nuked or getting blasted, which Bo winds up seeing. And the only detail she's able to get out is he's got black leather gloves that are like tipped in blue. Um, but the guards were pulling the body away before she could even get there. After that, you know, they all, you know, Ford dumps a healing potion down Caleb's throat, who he's like, well, I was sitting here rolling death saving throws, and it's not going well, so thank you. <laughs> um, but they make it into the sewers, and, you know, here, here is where, you know, we, we reach that, that, uh, that, that finale, or not the, not the finale, but like the end of the session cliffhanger that I kind of had to rewatch to get all the details in. Yeah, they, they find a... a- a trail of blood leading up to this figure leaning against the wall with the, what do you call it? A decahydrin, uh, is the, the shape of the, uh, a, the cannonball size blockhead. Basically. It's, like a, it's like a, basically a D 12 with handles on it that like is pulsing with some kind of, some kind of power. It was a mother box. I think it was a mother box. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it made me think of anyway. Um, and you know, this, this guy, the, the, the male humanoid, uh, with demonic horns, I'm not sure. Like and like all kinds of obsidian marks and hooks on his armor. It's like hard to like it's hard to know what's the armor and what's actually the person. So if is it is it a person just decked out in this demonic looking leather armor, or um, is it a demonic looking creature that's decked out in kind of le- regular looking, <laughs> uh, you know, black armor? I don't you know. know. I, to to me, you know, while he describes some demonic parts like the the horns. rear facing horns, the the kind of interpretation I was getting was like somehow insectile. Uh, so mm-hmm. like, you know, I'm waiting for the wings to kind of like, you know, pop up from the back. Uh, parademon. <laughs> <laughs> I told you, mother box parademon. <laughs> but, uh, you know, as, uh, you know, he begins, you know, speaking in Undercommon and, 
you know, Caleb, well, oh, here's a language I don't understand. I'm just going to cast Comprehend. And the, the thing pulls out this wicked hooked blade and, you know, begins to, to charge. And that's where they end. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, much. oh, come on. Yeah. So we know we're going to start with a fight uh, next week. Unless, you know, things like wind up going, getting smoothed over. Of like, look, I was just casting a language to understand you. So. Yeah, maybe. We're all on the same side. We hate these guys, too. They're dicks. But, <laughs> but I, I don't know. You know, while they, while they may not be fans of the Empire, I still don't think, you know, terrorist attacks would be their, is their, their way of going about things. So I think these guys are still on the opposite sides of, of this creature, whatever it is. Um, but we're going to have to wait and find out. The question is, guys, what do you, what do you think? What are you speculating? We've got a place where we can talk about it, and that is down in the comments below. While you're at it, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. You can check out the store over on nerdarchy.com. So until next time, stay nerdy. nerdy.